Hi, Howard Jones here. I hope you've been enjoying these last few tutorials. Um, the sort of format that I've been uploading my tutorials to YouTube have been in um, sometimes two part and three parts, just to sort of break them into bite sized chunks, really. Um, however, if this doesn't sort of suit you and you want to get more benefit from watching the full unedited, or reduced editing, so you're getting the actual b ifs and buts, etc. Then please do uh, consider popping along to my website at howardjonesart.co.uk, where you can choose either to join the live uh, Zoom tutorials, where there'll be the questions and answers uh, as the as the demonstration unfolds, and also you can buy single lessons, previous lessons, at a reduced rate. All come with um, a pack, a support pack, which includes um, photo images, sketches, tips and advice, and a full materials list. So, in the meantime, I hope you enjoy this video, and I hope to see you at the next one. There's a tree trunk underneath that shape there. That, I'll just use a little bit of uh, detail on that. Even that will probably disappear, to be honest. But again, it's not really there to, as to be um, an integral part of the painting. It's really more or less there to remind me as to how I want to convey this shape. So you could, and again, up here, I'm just doing these things to suggest, well, you know, when you get towards the end of the painting, why don't you consider these little these little houses, these little uh, bungalows that are probably on the top of that hill there. I'll just make a little mark to remember. Very subtle, very light, nothing too heavy that you can't get rid of. <clears throat> okay. Right. I think we ought to pick up um, a different mix now. I'll go back to my big round brush. Right. Okay. Um, so... I could use the big round brush, I could use a slightly smaller mop brush, but I'm gonna stick with the slightly larger brush. Right, the windows and the doors, I think are probably dry enough now for me to do what I want to do. And that is just to put some warmth and just picking up, just clean off this palette a little bit because I, I don't check clean the palette too often, but um, the times I do change it is purely to, to go from a cold color to a warm color or vice versa. That's about the only time you'll see me clean my palette. And that's exactly what I'm doing now. Well, I've been using mostly cool colors, cool blues and greens. So I want to use some more yellow, oak, uh, sorry, raw sienna, those sort of colors now. Um, so I will clean this palette. Let's pick up some water, put it pre, you know, Put the water in there first. Add that bit of raw sienna. Not too much. There's not a lot of color in these uh, in these distant buildings because the color saturation, the intensity of color, is is weakened by distance. So use a lot of water in there. And I just hit. If you just saw, I just hit a single stroke off the belly of the brush. Uh, I think I'll pick up a little bit of cobalt blue now. So I'm going back to cool. I'll keep it separate of here. And I'll do the same sort of brush stroke that I did then with the first color. But you might be tempted to look at the photo and say, well, I can see a clear delineation between the yellow building and the blue building. Ignore that. You know, you just want a more subtle transition between the two colors. So you run them into each other. Uh, then something that's a little bit of a mix of the two, just to finish the row of cottages off there. I think I'm going to bring this really weak, um, mostly raw sienna mix right down across my road here. So you could leave a little bit of white back here, just here around that territory, because that'll that'll keep the eye, the attention of the viewer better. Now I'm going to go right up and into the wall mostly and into, into this. I think there's a little bit of a pavement. Here. 
and then a little bit stronger maybe the color here and you can make some even though you can't see it in the photo you can make some directional brush marks here upwards into the road like this helps to create a bit of movement Now, before I'm done with this road, um, I'm going to, I'm cleaning my brush out here. You can't see me doing it, so I have to tell you. Cleaning the brush out here in my water tub, and uh, I'm taking nearly all the water out. And I've got a little bit of drifting here, so I'm just going to take it up, lift it off. So this thirsty brush now, with very little water in it, is able to act as an eraser. Just grabbing a bit of tissue so I can get that paint off the brush. So I've lifted paint off, means that there's paint in the brush. You can't keep doing this. You have to get rid of that, that paint. And then maybe uh, a little bit more of a lift off there. You could even lift off uh, another directional line down here like this. Off the belly of the brush, look, I'm not, there's no angle on this brush like this. OK, it's just flat. The brush is flat and parallel to the paper surface. I think I'm going to put in a really weak bit of alizarin crimson. And that little bit of weak alizarin crimson just gets mixed very slightly into the raw sienna um, mixing area. And so just going to use that one or two places like this, keep the brushwork to an absolute minimum. Now, I think I'm hard pushed, oh, sorry, I mean, it's just gonna leave that for the moment, okay? Let the road dry off. Um, now I'm pretty hard pushed to tell you exactly what the color of those roofs are over there. They're being hit by a lot of bright sunshine, that's for sure, because you can see shadows from the chimneys. Um, so that tells me, to keep my paint mix really weak, but it's a sort of slightly cool red purple. So I'm picking up a little bit, little bit of alizarin crimson, a little bit of cobalt blue, a little bit of alizarin crimson, a little bit of cobalt blue. And if this color while you're mixing it gets to look a little too strong, the obvious answer here is to add a little bit of water into it, which will weaken it. So see if I can get from left to right with a single brush stroke, okay? So place the brush, stay there for a second, okay? No downward pressure. Look, the brush handle is under my fingers, so I'm not, put it, I'm not able to put any downward pressure on it. And I'm just gonna pull it along that surface like that, okay? There we are. I think that's, I'm I'm happy with that. That that's that's about as close to the color that's in the photo that you're going to get. Now, I don't always copy photos in the colors, um, but sometimes it's a good idea too. And I see this as as one of those 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 moments. Um, and it's not to say that you can't. I just pick up a small brush for a moment, and I might just decide that somewhere in that lovely pale color there's a slight variation so i pick up the weakest bit of cobalt blue and i'll randomly slide the brush across somewhere like that so so flatness i'm always you know you know me i'm always talking about avoid you, you must avoid flatness in your colors in your areas in your shapes so the only reason why i did that was to avoid that whole run of shape there looking too flat Right, okay, and I think we've got a slightly darker version over here on this roof. So where was I? I was a lizard in crimson, slightly stronger if you notice, more paint this time. It was uh, cobalt uh, blue. Now the only difference with this is it's going to be slightly stronger than those roofs there, and it's going to be slightly warmer. So I've, I've picked up the two same colors that I started with over there. This time it's going to get a little addition and that addition is going to be burnt sienna. So I'll make sure I've got enough of the two of the other colors, of the other two colors, sorry. So I'm, I think I'm about there. And, and, and as I was saying earlier, no, nobody can really teach you. Nobody's going to be standing there holding your hand while you're mixing the strength of your colors. It's something that comes just from 
um, uh, you know, doing it a lot. So there we are. So that was three brush strokes. Okay, it's a broken delivery of paint, which may be good, it may not be good, but I'll tackle with it separately. I won't just go in and try and fix it. Fix it. What I'll do is I'll think slightly differently to avoid the obvious, what you think is the obvious thing to do, and that's to go in and fiddle around with it. Um, I, I would rather do this. I would rather get a clean brush and sort of say, well, do you know, I think I can see a, a, something a little bit warmer. Um, just picking up a bit of, uh, this is burnt sienna, which I didn't use in this mix. Sorry, I did use in this mix. Um, and I might just hit through that area there, look, until it registers. And it just about registers there now, that bit of, but it's wet in wet again. Um, if, if by the end of the painting, I still don't like the fact that I've used a broken um, dry brush effect in the roof, I'll wait for this to dry and I'll just knock some of it out. Right, let's get the building. Now the building on the right is almost the same color as the roof. That's how I see it. So I'm gonna go cobalt blue, a lizarin crimson, and just show you, you might get an idea as to how much I'm, uh, paint I'm picking up here at the very least. Cobalt blue, this is probably the strongest mix so far. Uh, alizarin crimson goes a lovely purple color. And then I'll warm this purple up with burnt sienna. And what I'm aiming for is a warm plum like color, plum, plummy type color. About there, something like that. Now, um, so I've got the round brush. I'm using a round brush. And, and if you look at the area, there are subtle nuances of uh, tone and temperature. But I'll just deliver anywhere for the moment, R around here, somewhere like this, okay, somewhere central-ish to the, to, to the main area. So very quickly, you can't hang it around here because you don't want it drying off with that sort of edge finish. Um, you want to sort of say, well, I'll go a little bit cooler so it was meant to be cobalt blue i picked up cerulean blue it doesn't matter it won't matter a jot um so i'll go a little bit cooler down the end there it does seem to be a break in the building here and i'll leave that area there for a moment like that again it's mostly off the um there's the there's the roof of my car there's the dark shape behind the windscreen, beyond the windscreen of the bottom of the wall of the house. Now, what's missing, if you look, is a warm, a warmer area. So I'll go um, burnt sienna, a little bit of raw sienna. You get this lovely sort of golden color here. And we'll warm up this lower area here. Notice that I land this fresh color, not in the paint, but at the very edge of it, like here, I'll land it there and move into that area, okay? So it's delivery. I always use this, it's a bit corny sounding, but I always use this sort of um, delivery and distribution. The brush does two jobs very rapidly in succession. It delivers the paint like this, and then you clean the brush, you leave some water in it, you land it somewhere where there's no paint, and you start distributing like this. And that way you have really good control over your paint. Uh, clean the brush again, because I want to do this bit here. Clean the brush, land the brush on the white of the paper and just shimmy up to the edges of that delivered paint. Okay. So I'm just going around uh, just going around what is the, the that car, something like that, about there. Now I'm going to speed dry this and, and get to the finish, which we're actually not that far off. Um, do I, yeah, sorry, before I do, I think we'll just make absolutely sure we're happy now with this area and the left-hand side. So if you, if you were to stop, you know, um, and look at what you've done so far, you might think, well, oh, shouldn't I be finishing this first before I go thinking about this? N well, give that some serious consideration because 
you can you know you can overwork an area we we all know that it's one of the biggest bugbears of of the watercolorist and probably any medium to be perfectly honest um is that we we spend too much time in one area whereas we should be just trying to nail the, the 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 basics the essence of the area nothing more we can come back to it okay um so so try to work like that if you can and then i i think i'm going to go over here and work across the back of the cottages back there so i'm going to pick up a little bit of viridian green this time or thalo green whichever you prefer they're both i think virtually identical colors uh thalo green is probably more transparent than viridian green so a bit of uh thalo or viridian green a bit of uh, burnt sienna okay you could use raw sienna because you should use both in, in a way because that way it'll um, give you a better you know a couple of weeks ago i think we started this year off in january with the color green well this is where if you've practiced that this is where it, it'll pay dividends there's a starting green i remember that demonstration quite well you know we, we then sort of deliver a little bit of uh, yellow in that green area so the green becomes a different green in that territory now and as you move down over the top of this hedgerow down here it's very warm so i would probably look at uh, a lot more raw sienna like this to suggest that that's getting you know the lion's share of the sunshine on this left hand side i need at some point to do some dry brush so i've just cleaned this brush off and um again it's it's the belly of the brush I, i'm pretty certain that when i by the end of a painting when a painting is completed the belly of the brush has done about 80 percent of the painting and i mean that I, it's it's that that's the ratio that's the amount of work you get from the belly of the brush you've really got to break away particularly in the initial stages get away from using the point of the brush for everything okay um you will need the point of the brush for certain things but we use it too much we've got to paint from the particularly us loose style watercolorists um we've got to paint from the, the off the belly of the brush right so how do we make this area a bit darker because it is darker well, the answer to that is let's go with a dark green, which is our viridian green. Let's go with a dark red, which is uh, alizarin crimson, and you get a dark, okay? And you get a dark green, which is even better. So in it goes. And again, I'm glancing up at my photo to give me ideas. It's a sort of, it's a, it's a sort of um i don't know it's like a question and answer a call and a response you you look up and you see that area has got a lot of shadow about it whilst that leading edge has got a lot more sunshine about on it so you know the the dark being the call the light being the answer um in here now i probably need to warm it up as well so same two colors for a moment make that lovely dark green but this time I'll warm it up with a bit of burnt sienna and that warmth is closer to us because this area of the um, left hand side is close to us so it'll be warmer I think this color will do for our tree belly of the brush nice sweeping shapes you can hear it if you're doing this correctly i'll go quiet for a second i don't know whether my microphone will pick this up um it's just a very quick expressive um side swipes off the belly of the brush every time right just checking now i can break up this a little bit more maybe there's a few stragglers uh of uh, branches and uh, and you certainly don't want to go be look, worrying about individual leaves um you get that effect by using this belly of the brush dry brush technique clusters of uh, clusters of uh, of leaves on mass right and then we go through the back 
in a similar fashion, but the mix is a little bit weaker, even though that doesn't look it, trust me it is, because I've just picked up more water. That looks dark, but it's it'll dry off a lot lighter than these areas. Now, can we just suggest a couple of rectangle shapes back there for those wee cottages, but bungalows? That's probably sufficient, to be honest. Right, okay. Now, this is really the finishing, um, these are the finishing touches coming up next. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to a flat brush. Now, again, you could use a big brush, round brush, mop brush, it's, it's whatever you're comfortable with most at this very moment. If you want to try out other brushes, I suggest you do that. Find, find yourself some extra time to practice those and um, move, you know, move around the different size brushes, etc. Okay, now that, let's look at what I need to do. Let's try and find out just by looking at what's already here as to what I need to do to this, to, to, to bring it all together. Um, and a great help to, in doing that is a, is a mount. So I'll just put the mount around it. Okay. I mean, you know, when I started out, I would probably get to this stage and think, oh, you know, I'm quite happy with that. At last, I've got a painting that looks okay. And I'd probably fe be fearful of taking it to where it should go. Um, because the obvious thing here is that there is, no shadow, okay. But let you know. Let's move on. Let's get a bit more sophisticated. Let's move from the amateur into the more professional um, territory, if we can. So, um, okay. So by putting that on there, yes, I think my shapes are okay. I think there's enough information back there. There will be a requirement for further dry brush detail. But I think the very next thing is those shadows, okay? So as you're all in your own painting um, uh, worlds there watching this, you give yourself a little roll on the drums before we put the shadow on. But don't be, you know, if, if you want to reduce the amount of stress, if that's the right word, fear of shadows, Here's a really good tip, and I, it's, it's one I've been using, I always use and always have used. Um, I have a roll of three sheets of paper, kitchen paper like this. This is my eraser. If a shadow, if something goes on in terms of a shadow I don't like, it comes straight off. You just stem it like that and lift it off. Okay, so let's see if we can get the, um, the shadow mix, the right strength. And I, as, I, as I say, I'll do my very best to explain the strength of this, of this shadow color. Now, the color itself of the shadow, um, you really, what you're dictated by is what's already on your painting. I'm going to shadow mostly, believe it or not, all that lovely work we did on this building. There's going to be a further glaze over it of shadow, and I might need just to speed dry it to make sure. The worst thing you can do here is mix up that lovely shadow and apply it to this area if it's still too damp. That'll just go horribly muddy. Speed dry it with a hairdryer, and then you're ready to go. So a lot of this, this side is going to be incorporated in the shadow because the shadow comes down the wall, it goes across the road in front of us here. I might come out a little bit further. And I tell you why, because if we don't come out a little bit further with the shadow, okay, we have too big an expanse of one very flat shape. Now, the flat shape is essential to keep. You must keep it. But as it stands at the moment, I think we need perhaps to come out a little bit further and reduce the flat, the flat area in doing so. Um, and then we're going to look at whether we can embellish shadow on the cottages. And I'm not relying on the photo for that because it's not very clear as to whether there's shadow on the sh cottages 
um, you can see it on the roofs, but not on the verticals of the walls. But I might choose. I want. I might want to do that. It's so. In a sense, the application of the shadow becomes a single move, almost a single shape that is linked. It's threaded throughout the entire design. So it sort of. It starts here. It might creep into the left hand side of that tree, but it certainly starts here. It comes along once it's done the vertical thing, it comes along horizontally out to here somewhere. But there's an opportunity here to, to tie the left hand side of the painting with the right hand side of the painting by threading a shadow that might travel across the road up into this area somewhere. It might even just be a, a, a broken bit of shadow over some of those over some of those cottages. Let's see. Um, and I never know, you know, again, something I, I say regularly, um, I, I really don't know, don't worry about whether the painting is going to be a success or a failure. I really don't. I really don't. Um, I just love doing it. Um, I, I, I can't, you know, I can't stress that enough. It's it, the enjoyment is all about the painting of it. Um, don't worry whether it's good or bad. It's don't get precious. If you can switch off from that pressure of being precious, it's amazing how much better your painting becomes. It just naturally see everything just seems to sort of naturally fall into place when you when you don't worry about anything. So the color, um, yeah, my shadow is going to be falling on quite a bit of warm. OK, so that tells me really to keep the shadow color on the cool side. So this is going to be ultramarine blue and I use a lot of paint. Um, I'd rather have too much and make it too strong to start off with than find myself running out when I haven't completed the, the painting, when I haven't completed the, the actual application of the shadow. That's a bit disastrous. And therein is a, a bit of an argument for painting your shadows as you go along. But there are, and when we get there in, in one of these lessons in the future, I'll, we'll talk about the pros and cons to these two options. Right, and I've added alizarin crimson, okay, into here. So I've got a good mix there. Um, the only the only sort of indication I can give you as to its strength is that if you find yourself a bit of white, clean um you might have a, a white porcelain plate to hand clean white surface like this if you take a single wipe through there you can see just how transparent it is against the white and i think that's about right and, and trust me I, I i say i think i don't really know and i've been mixing these colors for years um on a very regular basis don't worry about it the, the best of them get it wrong. What it is what, what the, the the wrong thing to do is not is not get the wrong mix. The wrong thing to do is to think, oh, that's the mix I've mixed. Um, I'll just have to put up with it. I've made the wrong mix. No, stop immediately and and change the mix. Okay, that's that's the wrong thing to do if you don't do anything about it. So. Because nobody will get it right for well, you, you occasionally get it right first time. So I'm going to go with this, but I'm going to probably need to warm it up at some point. But I'm going to start with this simple mix of ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson. Not a lot of alizarin crimson in there. I'm just looking at it now thinking it might need a bit more. I'll just use this little section here for that change of slight change of color. Now then, flat brush, gently pick up, um, have this at the ready. There's my area here. I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that there is, and I think there is actually something shadowed throwing, um, throwing a, a shadow like this across from here to here. Um, it's probably a, a chimney. And then down here. Now what I what I prefer to do is get a little bit weaker when I get near the ground. Okay. So I I don't change the color here. What I do is I put more water in this brush, not too much. That allows the warmth that's already in the initial wash that you painted in the initial wash to, um, to stay there, to stay visible. So you've got a shadowed upper area of the wall, but, it's, but because you've used a, a weaker, wetter, waterier, more watery even, um, mix 
for the lower territory, it remains warmer down here. So a little bit of shadow. It's, this is very arbitrary. It really is all about intuition. It's, it's how you think it should look. Now then, I'll go a little bit stronger again and pick up a little bit of burnt sienna, and I'll come down the wall, leaving that suggestion of the top of a wall here. Now it's a vertical, and here goes. Here we go. This this is where you know you just have to sort of put a smile on your face and say, "I wonder if this is going to work." Uh, it should do if you follow, you know, the things I've mentioned. Now there's something going across the, the road. Let's take it right across the road and have it make contact with the vertical hedgerow over there. Make a ver little vertical mark with the brush there. Um, I tend to take little areas out with a tissue like this, so it varies in strength like that. Um, but we know there's quite a bit of vertical down this, down here because of the wall. And then it comes back to a horizontal. So I change the brush again to, to a side, side, you know, off. Sorry, I'm, I've gone from a vertical brush stroke like that to using the blade, the thinner part of the brush. Now I think I want to come out a little bit here and make something similar to what's going on. on this side here. Now that's too cool. So immediately before it gets a chance to dry, I'm picking up some burnt sienna here. And I'll just go inside the shape. Don't try, try to leave it. Once an edge has been made, try to leave it. It's the edges that you don't want to be uh, changing. The interior with what's within inside the shadow shape that can be uh, adjusted, but the edge of your shapes of your shadows should not be uh, adjusted. You've got to have the confidence and a, a bit of practice to be able to do that. If you do find yourself needing to change the edge of a shape, maybe like here, because I feel as though the angle's slightly wrong, then load the brush carefully like this and be very careful to make a fresh edge there like that. Now, now I was talking earlier about that. I've got a little puddle here that I want to pick up and get rid of because that will turn into a, a back run a cauliflower, which won't look good there. Um, all right. OK, OK, OK. The only problem, yeah, just just put a little bit of color back in there because it was just when I lifted that bit of paint off, um, the one pigment came through and that was the blue. It's, it's things you, it, it happens, you just get used to it. Right, I'm talking about threading from one side of the uh, painting to the other. I'm going to thread by hinting that my broken shadow runs along this horizontal in front of the cottages. There might be a little bit of uh, slightly heavier shadows under those cottages, under the roofs, sorry. So I'm not using, I'm not referring to the photo. The photo doesn't do this. There, there isn't this effect in the photo, I'm trying to say. Um, so I'm running through here and this will allow me to pick up some shadow around here somewhere. So I've sort of traveled from right to left. I often, um, with, sh with shadows, when they fall on um, organic objects like leaves and trees, bushes, grasses, etc. Um, they will be most mostly soft of edge, or they'd be softer edges than if they fall on a hard surface like that roof and on the road. Those will be mostly hard edges to your shadows. But when it when they when shadows fall in amongst the um, trees and the, into the darker recesses of the trees, they, they tend to be slightly softer of edge. Again, it's that 70-30 ratio. You know, seventy percent hard edges. Uh, for, for, for hard surfaces with 30% soft edges. When soft surfaces, it's 70% soft edges and 30% hard edges. Take a little bit of getting used to remembering all that. But after a while, again, like I say, good old intuition tends to sort of guide you. 
once you've sort of practiced it once once a few times and been mindful of it you know oh yeah it's um you know it this is a this is a a shadow on a a lot of leaves a big bush um you, you learn it and it seems it does does stay it does stick with you now a much weaker effect back here i'll pick up a lot of water and go for my puddle which is a lot shallower a lot thinner and i'm just going to randomly hit some of those underneath some of those little sh shapes i made earlier to suggest this shadow back there upon the hillside and then a speed i'm going to speed dry before i do i'm still very tempted to to suggest a directional shadow off these cottage roofs like that just through there just that could be off this tree oh i didn't put um just want a little hint of shadow in the lower left part of this tree here because the light is obviously coming from the right hand side quite quite high in the sky hence the you know the length of the shadows it's quite a relatively short length in the shadows so we know that the the, the, the sun's up in the right hand side okay and now i'm going to finish it i'm going to speed dry this and we're going to finish the painting So the trusty pointed small round brush. Now this is where we do use a, a, a proper um, dry brush technique. Okay, so I'm avoiding picking up any water. I squeezed the, the the brush has been used before for something else for the windows, so it had a little bit of water in it. So I made sure I took all that water out my fingertips so a lot of fresh it's got to be fresh paint you will never get the amount of paint for this uh, quickly enough from um from a dried out bit of paint fresh ultra uh, fresh ultramarine blue fresh burnt sienna and that gives me this lovely rich sticky dry mix so where's our focal point i think we can look at um putting in a nice window lower down there you can scrape into that window shape if you want but it's so, even just that one mark that just that one window has gone in on top of this lot um makes that area pop out i don't know how that conveys whether it does the same on the on the computer screen at this point but i can i'll have to you'll have to accept my word for this it's a uh, it's already popping through so if you and, and the thing now of course is to be careful not to start doing the same everywhere else if this is at the reserve this what i'm doing right now is the reserve of the focal point territory only and the focal point territory is a is a is it is here anything in here that you do with this paint with this dark paint will help um nail the focal point so just going around what is the i don't know whether that really represents a car but it doesn't look awkward so it'll stay there um and now some right at the edges where so i'm choosing really right at the edge of the light to put these really darks in that's the best way that you'll make them pop no point in putting this dark these dark little uh, details on top of dark areas you need to just find a place right at the edge of the light and say that's that's my really dark territory just around here only sometimes within the shadow i might just go in a little bit like this just just but it, this is the area um, i'm just going to change brush because i think i've done all i can do with that brush there i'm going to pick up one of my favorite brushes that's the good old rigger brush just dunk it in water squeeze the water out oops get some more paint same two colors ultramarine burnt sienna and i'm just going to 
look for a single movement of the brush here. I, we were talking at the end of last week about how I hold the rigger brush. Now, for a lot of my work, I, I hold it like this. I hover, I stand when I work, and um, it becomes an extension of my index finger. And the only other position really I hold it in is, is I just allow it sometimes to slide on the inside of my index finger, just there like this. And, and nothing else much moves in your arm. It's just the fingers. And that allows me considerable control on um, just putting something over there for a bit of balance. Uh, and that allows me considerable control of the marks I make. So a couple of branches again back into the tree, something up there. Careful I'm not moving too far away from the focal point territory. Uh, there's, there are, of course, chimneys up here, which I've lost. So why don't I put a little dark left hand side uh, uh, shape? That would be the shadowed side of the chimney. And then I can just pick up my shadow mix that we were using a moment ago. And we can just run a little shadow off perhaps one or two of those, those chimneys across the roofs like that. And there we, there we have it, folks. Um, the only thing you probably haven't seen me do today is spatter with um, white gouache. I'll just do that very quickly. The other thing you could do, I've got the rigger brush back in my hand. And I, I'm holding it, as I said a moment ago, with the, with the stem there, the, 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 the brush handle there. And I'll just follow the edge with a little dry brush mix there. Um, same thing. Hold your breath. Make the mark. Hold your breath make the mark. Okay. Uh, that's cables, communication lines, another, you know, I, I, I have fun at this stage. I tend to just have fun at this stage in the painting. I'll stop there. We'll use a little bit of white gouache. That should just give us some time to have a chat, folks, before we sign off. So this is a white gouache straight out of the tube, as you can see at the top of the tube. This is Windsor and Newton designer's gouache. And I'd just like to do a bit of spatter, little inference of summer going on back there. And we'll put the mount round it and uh, see if it's any good. There we are. Roll on the drums. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And there, there we have uh, another exercise in shadow, um, shadow color choice. You know, you can see that I've sort of now this is referred to as pushing your color. I've pushed the color of my shadow. It's quite an attractive purpley color. Well, it, it's attractive to, to I, it, in, in my consideration. Um, you know, somebody else might want to choose uh, a different color. Um, that's what our game is all about. Um, but I, it, it, it's, it brings life and light to the, to the painting. Um, and if you look at, you know, the more abstract areas where the sun is on this roof, but the shadows uh, just cut across that shape. It gives it a nice bit of interest up there. And it's sort of directional. I can do a mini critique, you know, on my paintings. Uh, and I'll do that more often, especially on weeks when we've got more time, when the painting is finished a little bit earlier um, and do mini critiques. But um, yeah, it's sort of, sort of where I wanted it, I think. It might be tomorrow I would look at this and say, I put a figure in here you know, um, which we can do. We'll be doing figures again soon. You could keep this painting if you want aside for that time, for that day when we do figures. Because you can put figures in almost any stage of a painting, providing you haven't put too many in already, of course. Um, so, yeah, there we are. I'm coming over to you now. We're going to we're going to round down. Hope you've enjoyed uh, this one. 
and let's have a chat.